Thank you for that beautiful music. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the new church. It's good to have you with us. Um, welcome to those who are with us online. And we wish you could all be together. Um, we are celebrating the Holy Supper today, so if you're unfamiliar with that order of service, we, at the end of the adult talk, we invite people to come forward after the blessing of the elements, dedication of the bread and the wine. And you are welcome to come and kneel here or sit in the front row if you are more comfortable with that. And I'll make sure that you get the bread and the wine. There's also uh, grape juice in the center of the, of the individual cups for those who can't take wine. And there is some um, gluten-free biscuits or wafers as well. Bread, that's the word. <laughs> um, I think that's all I need to tell you, but you're welcome to be part of the service regardless of whether you consider yourself a member of the church or not. You're all welcome and invited to do that. So let's start with our prelude and invite the band up. stand as we sing our first song on page 206. You are the way on page 206.
Lord said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to them and dine with them, and they with me. Amen. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. Lord, you are the source of all our life. You give us everything that's good. You teach us everything that's true everything that's loving and wise. Help us to turn to you today with new conviction that we can follow what you teach step by step, day by day and moment by moment, knowing that it is something we need to pay attention to regularly. And Lord, when we fall, we ask that you raise us up, help us to brush ourselves off and begin again, knowing that this life can be a battlefield, a place where we struggle with many things, but with you there's hope for the battle is yours. Help us to put our life in your hands. Amen. Our Father, who art in the heavens, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so upon the earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. O Lord, forgive us our trespasses. Amen. I you all to be seated for reading and talk for the children. And if there are any children that want to come up and see what's going on up here, you're welcome to do that. All right, we have one volunteer. That's good enough for me. <laughs> good morning. Thanks for coming up. So today we're going to talk about a battle that happened. So there's the people of Israel, and they have a king named Saul. And they're facing the Philistine army. Now Saul and his army is about 600 people, and only two of them have weapons, Saul and his son Jonathan. And the Philistines, they have like 30,000 chariots and horsemen, and they have, it says, soldiers as many as the sand on the seashore. So have you ever been to the beach? Have you ever tried to count the pieces of sand that are there? No, because that would be crazy, right? It's so many, though, but he's saying it's a huge, huge difference. So Saul was thinking that there's no way this is going to work. So he's just sitting down under a tree doing nothing. And his son Jonathan says, well, maybe, maybe the Lord will help us. Why don't we try something? So him and his companion go, and they climb up to this place where there were a few soldiers, and they fought them and killed 20 of their soldiers. And the rest of the Philistines saw that happening, and they got scared, and they started fighting each other, and the whole army sort of destroyed itself. And the Israelites beat them. So they think, wow, that's an amazing thing. And they fought all day long, and they were very tired and very hungry. And something that, that Jonathan didn't know was that the king made a law. He said, look, Nobody is allowed to eat any food or any drink today until I defeat my enemies, until I win the battle completely. And Jonathan was walking along, and he, was, he had fought very hard and all day long, and he saw that the land was, there was like honey everywhere. Like there's so much honey in this land, 
The Lord said, this land flows with milk and honey. So he was being honest about that. There's honey everywhere. So Jonathan stuck his staff in the ground, picked up some honey, and he ate it just like that. And it says his face brightened, like he got energy from that. So when Saul heard that, he wanted to kill him, but the people said, are you kidding? Saul, I mean, Jonathan made this whole thing happen today. We, it's crazy. So we're going to talk about, a little bit more about that story after I read you about the honey part. Are you ready? It says, now the men of Israel were pressed to exhaustion that day because Saul had placed them under an oath saying, let a curse fall on anyone who eats before evening, before I have full revenge on my enemies. So no one ate anything all day even though they had all found honeycomb on the ground in the forest. They didn't dare touch the honey because they all feared the oath they had taken. But Jonathan had not heard his father's command and he dipped the end of his stick into a piece of honeycomb and he ate the honey. After he had eaten it, he felt refreshed. But one of the men saw him and said, your father made the army take a strict oath that anyone who eats food today will be cursed. That is why everyone is weary and faint my father has made trouble for all of us. Jonathan exclaimed, a command like that only hurts us. See how refreshed I am now that I have eaten this little bit of honey. If the men had been allowed to eat freely from the food they found among our enemies, think how many more Philistines we could have killed. Amen. So what's that story going to tell us about? Well, I'm going to talk about honey for a little bit. <laughs> so what do you know about honey? You know anything? You know where it comes from? Yeah, bees, they work very hard. Apparently a bee in its whole lifetime, for all the work that it does, might make a whole tablespoon of honey. Actually, no, that's not true. They make less than that all day long. So they fly all day long. They gather, maybe they go out for one little trip and they go to 50 to 100 flowers and they come back and they work very hard all day. And they build, you see these little what they call cells are this interesting shape, and that's where they put the nectar and the pollen, and it turns into this honey that feeds them and feeds the new babies and so forth. So they work very hard for that. Do you ever eat honey? Yeah? Does it taste good? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's sweet and delightful, right? We can also, sometimes churches, this is a wax candle, are made out of beeswax. So you can think all the things that bees do that really help us. And the Lord says, actually, that bees, the way they work and the way that they spend all their time trying to help the whole hive together is a little bit like heaven, how we all work together. And it's delightful. That honey pictures the delight that we get when we help other people. So Jonathan, fighting all day long and not eating anything and being tired, is kind of like us when we think, you know, there's, I shouldn't have any reward for the hard work I do. I should just suffer for that, just deal with the pain. The Lord's saying, you know, you should have delight from that. It's enjoyable to help other people. So when you think about this today, and I have so many honey sticks for all of you, but only one of you came up. So, <laughs> <laughs> But you can all have one if you want one. But I want you to have this. And you want you to taste it later on and just see what it tastes like. Because what the Lord is trying to tell us is that when we work hard, when we try to do something to help, because Jonathan could have done what Saul did and done nothing, and nothing would have changed, right? But he said, maybe the Lord will help us. And I think that's kind of what we want to think about in our own life, is maybe if I do something, the Lord will bless it. Maybe he'll bring happiness. And you know what? When we do that, we have the delight of it, the joy of it, the sweetness of it. So would you be so interested in passing these around? Maybe I need some more. I don't know how many I have, but I, just like honey, there's always more. So let's get some more of these, just in case. All right. Thank you very much. I want to pass those out to people. Appreciate it. And thanks for listening. And we will sing our next song in just a moment. Yes, please stand as we sing on page 134, Only in God, on page 134.
you to bow your heads for a blessing on the children. Lord, we pray that you bless your children, keep them safe, teach them your word, help them to learn to love you and to love one another. Thank you, Lord, for all the blessings we receive through them as well. May the Lord give his angels charge over you to keep you in all of your ways. Amen. All right, you be seated, and children, you're welcome to stay with us, or you can go play outside if you'd rather do that. But we're going to continue with some more readings, and this is from First book of Samuel, shared by Chuck Ebert. First Samuel 13 and 14 and portions of them. The Philistines gathered together to fight with Israel, 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen, and, and people as the sand, as sand in which uh, the seashore is in multitude. When the men of Israel saw that they were in danger, then the people hid in caves, in thickets, in rocks, in holes, and in pits. As for Saul, he was still in Gilgal, and all the people followed him, trembling. And Saul, and Saul numbered the people present with him, about 600 men. Now there was no blacksmith to be found throughout all the land of Israel. So it came about on the day of battle that there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people who were with Saul and Jonathan. But they, were found with Saul, but they were found with Saul and Jonathan, his son. Now it happened one day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man who bore his armor, Come, let us go over to the Philistines' garrison that is on the other side. But he did not tell his father. And Saul was sitting in the outskirts of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree, which is a migron. Then Jonathan said to the young man who bore his armor, Come, let us go over to the garrison, the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be the Lord will work with us, for nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. Then Jonathan said, Let us cross over to these men, and we will show ourselves to them. If they say to us, Wait until we come to you, then we will stand in our place and not go up to them. But if they say, come up to us, then we will go up. For the Lord has delivered them into our hand, and this will be a sign to us. So both of them showed themselves to the garrison of the Philistines. And the Philistines said, look, the Hebrews are coming out of the holes where they have hidden. Then the men of the, the, men of the garrison called to Jonathan and his armor bearer and said, come up to us and we will show you something. Jonathan said to his armor bearer, come up after me for the Lord has delivered them into the hand of Israel. And Jonathan climbed up on his hands and knees with his armor bearer after him and they fell before Jonathan. And as he came after him, his armor bearer killed them. That first slaughter which Jonathan and his armor bearer made was about 20 men within about a half an acre of land. And there was trembling in the camp, in the field, and among all the people. The garrison and the raiders also trembled, and the earth quaked, so that it was a very great trembling. Now the watchmen of Saul, of Saul and Gibeah of, of Benjamin looked, and there was the multitude melting away.
Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. So I have to apologize first by not having my mic on for my lay reading. So I'm aware of that. Yes, thank you. User error. So, so at the subject at hand, how many of you would say you've been faced with a situation that you believed you couldn't handle in your life? It was too big, too overwhelming. Or it's too difficult and you can't see your way out of it. Or maybe you just felt hopeless about your situation or your spiritual life. 
Well, it can feel like life is a battleground, right? Feels like we are fighting things all the time against negative desires that we might be feeling or influences in our life. We're battling against ourselves, right? Fighting against our own. I mean, there seems like there's two sides of a part of us that wants what's heavenly and what's high and ideal and part of us that cares about ourselves and sometimes wants to wallow in things that are hurtful to us or other people. Or maybe we're battling against the will of our partner or spouse or our children. Has that ever happened? <laughs> or maybe we're battling to stay optimistic or hopeful or motivated in our life or not fall into a state of despair about things. And I want to say that's exactly why there are so many stories in the word of that are battles. There's so many stories about warfare. And you say, well, it's a book about love. Why is there all these stories about fighting? Why does that happen if it's a book about love? Well, it's true. And if you know anything about love, you know that you have to fight for love, right? You have to work for it. It's not so something that falls into your lap and magically, and like, oh, although in some ways that's true. <laughs> it does fall in your magic lap in your lap magically in some ways, but you have to fight for it to keep it alive. We fight against our selfish tendencies that are trying to kill it or fight against our own apathy, our own fear. And so the first thing to realize when we are awake or woken up in our spiritual life, and if we want to go spiritually, that we're going to have to engage in a type of warfare for our spiritual self. And like warfare, it can get ugly. It can shift. It can be painful. But there are also times of rest. There are times of peace and victory. Now, the Israelites in these stories picture that noble part of us, that noble side of us that wants to change, that's intent on heading to the promised land, that really wants to follow the Lord. And the enemies picture those things within ourselves that we need to fight against. Different nations picture different issues that we are at war with. And sometimes the odds are very bad, and it seems very impossible. And it seems like, at least that's how we can feel, right? Like this is an impossible situation. There's no hope of me getting through this. A couple examples from the word like that. You might think of David against Goliath. David's a, a youth, and Goliath is a nine foot plus tall seasoned warrior. And, but David goes up against him, not because he feels he's brave and strong himself, but because he says the battle is the Lord's. Or Gideon, who's facing the Midianite and Amalekite people of the East, who are described as having as many soldiers as are locusts and as are our sand on the seashore. And his army has been whittled down to 300 people to fight against this huge army. But as you know, they're able to defeat them in the story. Or the story today of the Israelites facing the Philistines, where their soldiers are as many, again, as the sand of the seashore, and 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen. And the Israelites had 3,000 warriors, but they was dwindled down to 600. And only two of them had weapons. <laughs> it's kind of a ridiculous situation, right? There's no blacksmiths. The Philistines said, we're not going to have blacksmiths in the land because we don't want to be able to help the Israelites have weapons. And these stories can picture how we can feel sometimes, like we are in our very small place, feeling alone, feeling helpless against this very large, monstrous army or individual that we're trying to fight against. We're facing these severe temptations or addictions or insidious habits that seem impossible to fight, or the loss of relationship or our health or the loss of a loved one. So in those situations, how do we go forward? What do we do? Well, two things we should realize. One of them is the Lord can handle it. The battle is the Lord's, as David said, fighting off or heading off into the battle. He knew he couldn't do this by himself. It wasn't because of his own strength. And as Jonathan said in the story, it's maybe the Lord will be with us. And the second thing is it won't happen all at once. The only way to work and fight against these things in our life that we struggle with is one day at a time, even sometimes a moment at a time. The Lord said in Exodus about the children of Israel driving the enemies out in the land. He says, I will not drive them out from before you in one year, 
Little by little I will drive them out from before you until you have increased and you inherit the land. A little bit at a time. So keep those things in mind. The Lord can handle it. It'll happen a little bit at a time. And we can get impatient with that, right? Because we want it to be instant. I've changed my mind. I'm going to change the way I live. Why isn't it changed immediately? Why do I keep struggling against this? Because it takes a long time. <laughs> it takes a, it's a battle of our life. So the scene today is the Israelites, again, are facing this large army, you know, as many as the sand of the seashore, 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, and they have 600 people, and two of them have weapons. So you think, impossible. Well, there's two different reactions we see in the story, too. Saul, the king, is just sitting under a pomegranate tree, and that's how I kind of picture sometimes how we, how we react to these situations. Is like, nothing I can do. Nothing I can do. I'm just going to sit here. I can't do anything. Why try? So we're immobilized by fear or in doubt. We don't really rely on the Lord's strength and power. Jonathan, on the other hand, he has a plan, independent of his father Saul. He wants to go with his armor bearer, and it says, it may be, and I love that, that mindset, it may, it may be that the Lord will work for us. Who knows? It may be. For nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. So Jonathan says, you know, the Lord has done amazing things. It may, it may be that he'll be here for us. It may be that he'll help us. And he says, we will show ourselves to them. If they say to us, come up to us, then we will go up for the Lord has delivered them into our hand. So Jonathan and the armor bearer go and they kill 20 Philistines. And what it did is it sent confusion through the whole Philistine army and they began to fall on each other, as it says, and the whole thing melted away. This huge army falls apart. So to me, the lesson of this story is, if you don't know what to do, where you feel immobilized, you feel like there's nothing you can do, do something. Do something. It may be that the Lord can work with that. No matter how small it may be, do something. And you might say, well, I need to know the whole answer. I need to see how it's going to unfold. I need to know that my efforts are going to change everything. Like sometimes we, we tell ourselves that kind of stuff, right? Well, I need to know what's going to happen ahead of time. You're not going to know what's going to happen ahead of time. It's just not going to happen. But we want that. But do something. The Lord can only bless our efforts. We have to act. We have to do something. That's how it worked with David and Goliath. David comes to it, and he sees the situation, and he's like, here they are day after day challenging each other, and nothing's happening. And David's like, isn't there a cause? Shouldn't we do something? Shouldn't somebody go and do something, and he says, I'll go, because the battle is the Lord's. The writings say this, that true faith is action. Faith in action is true faith. In other words, got to do something. Faith isn't just what I think. Faith is how I live, what I do. So we have a choice. We can be like Saul. We can sit under a tree and feel helpless and hopeless about our situation. The problem's not going to go away. Or we can be like Jonathan and make a move. You say, well, what difference does it make? Well, in this situation, Jonathan killed 20 people out of millions of soldiers. But it caused the whole thing to unravel. And I think that's the power of it. We do something. It has a series of consequences that extends to eternity, as the doctrines say, if we do something. So find something positive you can do and do it. And I like to pick the brain of my therapist brother and say, well, what kind of advice do you give people who are struggling? Because, you know, I'm trying to help people who are struggling too. And he says, just do the next good thing. Just do the next good thing, whatever that is. What is that thing you can do? You don't have to solve the whole thing. Just do something. And again, this Life of ours is a journey. It's a process. The children of Israel wandered for 40 years, and that was only to get them to the promised land. And then they had to work very hard then to 
to dispel the enemies that were in the land. And that picture is not necessarily literally time as much as a state of being, that we are on a journey through the wilderness and it's a state of time. Don't know how long it'll be, but it will be a process. Heavenly Doctrine says this, when we are being regenerated, we are not regenerated hastily, but slowly. That regeneration or the implanting of the life of heaven in us begins from our infancy and continues even to the last of our life in the world, and that after our life in the world is perfected to eternity. Our life in the world is only a plane for the perfecting of our life to eternity. What I hear that saying is you don't have to get it perfect in this world, but do you create a space or a place where you're trying so that the Lord can help you? And you're going to be working on this forever. So even after death, you're going to be working on what the course that you've set. It's a long, slow path. And you know, we, like, we could be like Dorothy from the Wizard of Oz and just click our heels and say, there's no place like home and hope we're transported back to Kansas. But it's not how it works. Or we could say, well, why don't we just get on the plane in Cairo and fly over to Jerusalem and just get to the promised land that way. That's not how it works either. <laughs> it doesn't work. So we look for the quick fix or the escape, and we do the same, same thing in our life in external ways, like look for the lottery ticket or the, the new diet that will change everything or the new relationship that will fix us and, or the dopamine hit from a like on Facebook or Instagram or whatever it is that kind of stimulates life. The reality is we have to walk the path of life, including the hardships and the trials. We must face our issues or they will not leave. They're just going to be there unless we face them and work through them. I love what someone, I don't remember where I heard this, but someone was saying, you know, just trying to work on the symptoms of your difficulties is like having this pile of excrement right there and, and you're just like, I'm just going to wave the flies away. Like, and just keep doing that over and over. Like, why are you, st why are you still here? It's like, no, you've got to get rid of the pile of excrement, right? You've got to work on the issue that you're dealing with. You can wave flies all day long, but it's not going to get you anywhere. Another part of the story, which I think is important to draw out, is that Jonathan, his actions picture this idea that life is to be enjoyed too. It's part of what comes to us when we're active, when we're useful, when we're helpful to other people. You can have Saul's attitude that it's just, the, I, I don't feel like I can do anything. I'm just going to sit here and not do anything. But Jonathan's is, I, can, I got to do something. And as a result of that, he takes in the honey. And the honey pictures the delight of doing what is good and helping other people. He says, the writings for the New Church say we were created that we may live forever in a state of happiness. Not just after you die, but in this world too. There's happiness in this world that we are to enjoy. In Saul's picture is, well, I'm not gonna, no one's allowed to have any enjoyment, no food, till I've vanquished all my enemies, till everything's destroyed. You might think, I can't enjoy my life until I've shunned every evil possible and it's all finished and I'm perfect, I've got it all sorted out. No. As Jonathan says, my father has troubled the land. How much better if the people had eaten freely today? For now would there not have been a much greater slaughter among the Philistines. And how much more growth would we experience if we allow ourselves to accept the good things the Lord offers us in our life instead of beating ourselves up and saying, I'm just not good enough to enjoy it. And then you have to spend extra time healing from the self-inflicted wounds that we've given ourselves. Yes, there are battles. There are many battles, and there are rewards. The, the land that the children of Israel are fighting for is the land that flows with milk and honey. It's a place of joy and delight and peace. That's where the Lord is leading, and he gives us experiences of that. So spiritual life is such that we always have a choice. And I think that's what this story pictures in our life, too, is that we always have a choice. There's a destructiveness of idleness. It's like, I can't do anything. I'm just going to sit here. But the kingdom of heaven is a kingdom of uses. How can I be useful? How can I contribute? And I love looking at this situation of the bees. Um, 
there's three different types of bees as I understand it. There's the queen and the drone and the worker bees. And the queen lays all the eggs, you know, she creates those, those uh, fertilized, or she creates the eggs that are fertilized and, and they, all the new bees are born, but the drones kind of just hang out. And one of them gets to impregnate the queen, but everyone else, there's just one. The rest of them just sit there and eat the honey and really don't do anything. And the worker bees are always working, always gathering the nectar and the pollen, and they come back, and the drones sit there and eat the honey that they're, <laughs> they're gathering. But in the winter, we're told that the drones get kicked out. Like, get out of here, you're not helping out at all. Just get out, and they freeze and die. And the writings say, well, that's kind of what heaven's like, <laughs> too. Not that, that heaven's a place of usefulness. If you contribute to it, you can enjoy the delights of it. But if you don't contribute in any way, you're just going to get pushed out, left out, and freeze and die. <laughs> that's kind of dramatic, but. Delight is in being useful, and that's what the bees teach us. And I want to talk about relationships for just a moment. In marriage, it says, I think sometimes we think that the feelings of love that we crave or that we desire in our relationships will just show up. Like, well, it'll just, it'll just be there. Well, the feelings are, those loving feelings are a byproduct of doing good things for the other person. What's the next good thing I can do for this person that I allegedly love? Could you do love 180 says, Part of what brings us delightful love is the mutual desire of mind and heart to do the other every good. So is that in our mind? What is the every good that I can possibly do for this person? And when we do that, it generates those feelings of love that we're looking for. And you know, if you've ever been in a relationship, the feelings come and they, they go, right? Sometimes the feelings just stop. Like, I don't feel it anymore. So what do you do? Uh, just end it, right? No, you do something. <laughs> and I'm going to read this thing from Stephen Covey, which you've heard me read before, but I'm reading it again. It says, at one seminar where I was speaking on the concept of proactivity, a man came up and said, Stephen, I like what you're saying, but every situation is so different. Look at my marriage. I'm really worried. My wife and I just don't have the same feelings for each other we used to have. I guess I just don't love her anymore, and she doesn't love me. What can I do? The feeling isn't there anymore, I asked. That's right, he reaffirmed, and we have three children we're really concerned about. What do you suggest? Love her, I replied. I told you the feeling just isn't there anymore. Love her. You don't understand the feeling of love just isn't there. Then love her. If the feeling isn't there, that's a good reason to love her. But how do you love when you don't love? My friend, love is a verb. Love the feeling is the fruit of love the verb. So love her. Serve her, sacrifice, listen to her, empathize, appreciate, affirm her. Are you willing to do that? To me, that encapsulates really well what love is. It's how we commit to and treat other people that we love. And the feelings of love will come. Or we can be like Saul and just say, well, I'll just sit here and wait and hope that things get better. Or we can have the attitude of Jonathan, the Lord can handle it. I gotta do something. I'm gonna be proactive. As the Lord said in the Gospel of John, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. The Lord wants us to have that joy in life. And the writings say this, that latent in the affection of every angel's will is a certain inner tendency which draws the mind to accomplish something. By accomplishment, the mind finds peace and satisfaction. This satisfaction and peace produce a state of mind receptive of a love of useful service from the Lord. From the reception of this love comes heavenly happiness. Heavenly food in its essence is nothing else than love, wisdom, and useful service combined. That is useful service accomplished through wisdom out of love. And the writings say this again, angelic happiness is in use, from use, and according to use. So what can we do? Do something. Find something we can do. Read to end what Anne Lamott says. She says, hope begins in the dark. The stubborn hope that if you just show up and try to do the right thing, the dawn will come. You wait and you watch and you work. You don't give up. Amen.
just a moment, I'm going to invite you, if you'd like to, come forward for the Lord's Holy Supper. And one of the things that the Lord says about the Holy Supper is that it's, it's the holiest act of worship because the bread and the wine together picture the Lord's love and wisdom, all the things that the Lord gives us. And one of the things we're asked to do around, it's a sacrament of repentance where we think about what is it that I'm working on or what am I trying to accomplish? And it's kind of a signature and seal that the Lord will help us to strengthen that. So we take in the bread representing the Lord's love, knowing the Lord loves us and is helping us. We take in the wine knowing the Lord is giving us guidance and helping us to find our way if we approach him. So if you want to come forward, you're welcome to do that. Again, you can come kneel or you can come sit and you can space yourselves up as, as much as you like to feel safe for that. I am going to um, offer individual blessings. If you don't want to receive that, then you can take off before that after you get your wine or grape juice. Um, and I think that's it. So I'm going to uh, invite you in just a moment to come forward. The bread of God is he who comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. O oh Lord, may this bread remind us of your love for us, which is constant, never-ending, and desires our eternal happiness. blood of the new covenant which is shed for many for the remission of sins. O oh Lord, may this wine remind us of your wisdom and your truth which opens our mind and guides us step by step towards you and your heavenly kingdom. you to bow your heads or kneel with me in prayer. O oh Lord Emmanuel, meaning God with us, we thank you for your presence, which is perpetual, constant every moment. We ask you to be more present with us and maybe more clearly help us to be present with you. Help us to open our hearts, and our minds, and our hands that we may welcome you in. You standing at the door and knocking all the time, help us to hear your voice and let you in, that we may dine together. Or help us to find ways to be useful so we can keep the hells at bay and help you to be more close. Be with us, Lord. Lord, save your people and bless your inheritance and feed them and lift them up forever. Amen. You're invited to come gather yourselves together to the supper of the great God.
peace. And may the Lord be with you.
in peace, and may the Lord be with you. You could bow your heads for a blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. I invite you to stand for the closing of the word. Please remain standing as we sing our final song on page 105. Let us break bread together. Page 105. to share.
Thanks all for coming today. We won't have a discussion today.